Today's topic is the 401k worth it. You could also plug in 3B, 457B. They kind of all are going to fall into that tax deferred group. But we are challenging the most popular investment tool in the United States. Trillions of dollars. We're literally fighting against trillions of dollars. But there are things to consider. And while we are big fans of the 401k and 403b, especially for our higher income households, there are things to keep in mind. And then to add some complexity, some thoughts, some research to it, we're going to also bring in some research from outside experts to give you actual percent values on how valuable or not valuable the 401k, the freebie could be to you. There's only one thing we can do from here. Let's get into it. Okay, first and foremost, you know, we kicked out the intro video, right? You come to see the content, not the intro video. But one quick reminder, if you have not subscribed, now would be a fantastic time to subscribe to the channel. Click on the bell icon, get a notification every time we release new content like this big hitter. That's it. That's all I'm going to bombard you with. So let's get into some of the details. First, simplicity, right? I assume most of us know what a 401k does, but let's just go over big ticket items on things that you should keep in mind about the 401k. So your 401k could be a qualified retirement account or what we would label as just your employer retirement plan, right? And this can take different forms. We're going to assume it's employer 401k plan. We're not going to go down like solo K, independent contractors, just MK here, 403B, employer side of things. So main things to keep in mind. Well, there's limitations, right? The first thing is, how much can you put into the plan? So for example, let's just use the 23,000 limitation. As of the year 2024, this number usually changes every year with a little inflation adjustment. You can get $23,000 into your qualified plan. Now, over the age of 50, you can get a little bit more into it. But for the most part, you're right around at 23,000 with those smaller increases year after year. Other items that can come into play here. Employer will usually put some funding in there as well. We call this a match. Sometimes it could be a simple 3%, a 4%. Sometimes we'll give you one of those wonky percentages. Like we'll give you 100% for the first three and then 50% for the next six. And you're sitting there like, I think we made this too difficult. But keep an eye on those things. I think if you take away one thing from this video and any of our past videos, that's free money. So at a minimum, I don't care who, what, why, where, most of you should be taking advantage of that free money. That's kind of like foundational stuff. Take advantage of that. Uh, You don't want to miss out on that. Another thing I want to throw in here, because this this is one that is still missed quite a bit. and, And we work with physicians, extremely smart individuals. This one still catches some people up. So when your employer is making contributions, there's something usually tied to that called a vesting schedule. Now, with safe harbor plans that usually won't have one, but if there's a profit share or some type of extra contribution, vesting is really important. Vesting means how much of the employer's money do you get to keep? And I emphasize employer because whatever you put into it from your paycheck, that's always your money. There's no vesting schedule on that. But if your employer gave you 10 grand in matching over the last year or a few years, and the vest schedule says, hey, you're still at 0%, and then you leave that employer, you don't get to take any of that 10 grand with you. If you were at a 50%, you get to take half of it with you. But this is really important. So if you're planning on kind of cutting the cord anytime soon, leaving your employer, see where you fall in that vesting schedule. Some are a little bit more even, well, they'll say, hey, 20% every year over five years. But there's also some called cliff, where they might say, hey, you get nothing for three years, and then it jumps up to 100%. So if this is the first time you're hearing this word, just give a little peek into your, we usually call it the summary plan description, the SPD. But in there, like usually on the first like two to three pages, it'll have a vesting schedule. Just take a peek at that. Other items that really make the 401k, 403b famous. I keep plugging in 403b. Again, we work with physicians and physicians in the academic side. Usually they won't have a 401k, they'll have a 403b. They pretty much are brother and sister, very similar. Tax deferred growth is really one of the main benefits of this. And actually, when we get into the analysis from our, I'm going to call him our guest expert. He has no idea that we're using him as a guest expert, but I'm using his research in this post today. But tax deferred growth is saying, hey, while it's in there, you don't pay any tax on it, right? So I put 10 grand in there. It grows for decades. I never get a tax bill in that given year. I can go in there and buy and sell 100 times. It can spit out dividends, interest, all that stuff. I don't get a 1099. It just grows in there tax deferred, which is what we label as compounding interest. This is one of the biggest benefits 
to your qualified account. So as it's in there, it keeps growing. You had 10,000 in there, it gets 1,000. Well, now you have 11,000. That 11,000 now gets some interest, some growth. That's the tax deferred growth. That's the compounding interest. To me, that's the magical sauce. That's the magical sauce in investment. Other things to keep in mind, investment lineups, right? You're going to be somewhat limited. Most plans will keep you to what I call the menu, right? They'll give you your menu and that's what you're going to have on there. Some fancy 401k plans will give you brokerage options now where you can move the funds over and do your own investing. For the bulk of you, I would argue probably all of you, you don't need to get fancy with it. Keep it simple. Follow those index funds. Assuming that they have good investment options, I should put that little asterisk in there. One thing to keep in mind, because I just saw this on a recent financial plan that was built. When you do that brokerage option, the biggest downside, in my opinion, is it will not automatically invest the funds for you, right? It'll move it over to this account, but you still have to invest it. Now, that's great because you get the freedom to do that. But to me, that allows the most dangerous thing in finance to come in. Emotion, right? You get into the 401k, you're thinking, great, I have... $20,000. $20,000. I forgot to jump in there for the whole year. Silly me. There's problems with that too. But now all of a sudden you have 20000 sitting there, but you click on CNBC, the market's up a lot, the market's down a lot. You're going to allow emotion to come in. That is one thing that we want to avoid in all of finance. I don't care what account it is. Certainly your 401k, because this is your longest term account. Again, and usually we'll work with Gen X, Gen Y in here. So we got decades with these things, right? We got a long time to go. So keep an eye on those items. Again, just a simple little intro. I assume most of you understand the high level details, but kind of some cliff notes there on the intro. Now let's head into the good side of okay benefits. All right. First up on this one, I actually kept this list at two. I'm going to add a few things on the other one, but my biggest benefit of a 401k plan, when I describe it, is it's simple. I think a lot of personal finance needs to be simplified, put on repeat, really trying to automate as many things as possible. But simple, I wrote down two things for simple. One, it's easy to set up. This is why it's the most popular retirement account in the United States, right? It's pretty darn easy, right? Some of you probably have some horror stories, but for the most of us, it's pretty easy. You go through open enrollment, they tell you sign up for 401k plan, you type in your percentage. Great. The employer throws some money in there. They tell you, hey, get on the website, get out of that target date fund that they defaulted to, build a little allocation. Boom, you're good to go. That is simple. And that is a good thing because it's easy to set up and it's also easy to contribute, right? You just tell your HR or even the 401k portal, hey, I want to do 5% of my salary or 10% of my salary or 2% or 12. It's easy. And that is important because anything that is difficult, the more difficult it is, the least I should say, the less likely we are to actually put that in play. So that's simple. Also, investments are simple. Going back to what I just said, I don't care how smart you are, it's likely should be done a lot more simple in terms of investing, right? Even if you can go to that brokerage option and have this huge list of hundreds, if not thousands of investments, you probably only needed like four or five index funds in there. So that is a really good thing. That's why I always brag about the TSP, the thrift savings plan. I just love that plan. It's simple, it's low cost, easy to understand. Even if you don't know anything about finance, it's a pretty simple, like, hey, here's five funds you can choose or we got these target date funds. After that, that's all we got. That's beautiful. It's simple. It's easy. So I love that. And then the other thing I'm going to come in here that I already hit on is just tax deferred growth. That is a big benefit. Now we're going to find out how big that benefit is soon. And that's the the big part of this uh, video. But tax deferred growth is one of the biggest benefits in there. So those are my goods. I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, I'm going to list a few more for the bad, only because the goal here is to kind of challenge this story. Again, I'm a huge fan of the 401k, 403b. I still think it makes a lot of sense for pretty much everyone. But there are things to keep in mind. And that's what I want to start to get to here in the second half of the video. Okay, the bad. So on the bad side, here's what we're going to list. First one is limited investments. I know what you're thinking, Chad, you just said this is a good thing. Yes, but you're still limited investments. And what I mean by limited in investments is I'm saying, hey, hopefully they have some index funds. I would say a perfect world, we can get your actual expense ratio, probably a fee that you don't even know exists, but it's in there. The funds you pick all have their own expense ratios. Your 401k does have fees, believe it or not. We're going to talk through that as we go here. But the limited investment lineup could really hurt you there. Now, MKs, in my opinion, have come a long way in a relatively short period of time. And we're seeing more and more index funds, more and more low cost options. Literally just looked at a new 401k plan for one of our clients yesterday, like two basis points, four basis points, beautiful, low cost plan all in. I think I don't think one fund was over eight basis points. Beautiful. So when your lineup is limited, but it has good low cost options, I'm all for it. That's where we get a little bit, hmm, we get a little bit worried there. Again, coming back to fees. 
Your 401k plan does have fees. Everyone thinks, oh, it's free. It's cool. I got it. Yeah, it's great. The average fees for 401k plans at, at last check was right around 50 basis points, 45 basis points. Uh, some of that's actually coming from Nick's post, who I'm going to reference here in a bit. He used the 45 basis points. I think I've seen a few others that maybe list 50 basis points at this point. But regardless, there are fees on 401k plans. Usually, the smaller your plan, the more likely you have some type of like admin fee getting built in there. You likely don't see it because it all comes out behind the scenes. The larger your plan, because of the size, those fees are probably much lower, if maybe not even even non-existent, even some small employers, they will pick up those fees. So it doesn't affect everyone. So we're going to kind of stick with that 50 basis points, 45 basis points. Probably the main argument for is the 401k worth it is this next one. And it's not liquid, right? Your 401k, your 403b is not liquid, meaning that you can't just go in there and pull the money out. Now, technically you can, but for anyone under 59 and a half, at a minimum, you just got hit with a 10% penalty. That's not cool. On top of that, you also have to pay ordinary income tax. Just throw out some high level numbers. Let's just say you're in the 30% tax bracket, 35% tax bracket, and then a 10% penalty. All of a sudden, you're at 30, 45% of your money. You pull out 10 grand, you're only taking home about five grand or so of it because of these taxes and penalties. Now, technically, all 10 grand will get to you, but you're going to have to level up with Uncle Sam come tax time. So, not being liquid. And I think this can go a lot of ways. I think some financial influencers out there take this too far. I think the insurance salespeople love to crush the 401k because they'd rather you put that into this huge commission-based product. We'll probably get some funny comments about that. But that's not the point we're trying to make here. We're going to compare this to like a brokerage account, a taxable brokerage account as we kind of work our way through here. So in that case, it's not liquid. And it's something to keep in mind that when you put money in there, you have to tell yourself, I'm not touching this until... 60 plus. And then the other concern that we always have, and this is one that we show very clearly in financial plans, is future tax rates, right? And probably said this in other videos, I don't care what political party you are. When you look at the deficit our country runs year in and year out, Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter, we are likely not going to see lower tax rates. Maybe we get lucky and they just stay where they are today, but they're likely going up. And why is that important? Well, remember what a 401k does. You have a dollar today. You put it into your 401k plan. Let's just say your effective tax rate is 35%. You just save 35 cents on that dollar. But remember, you still have to pull that out later. The current assumption is, the current hope is, well, when I'm retired, my tax my bracket will be lower. So now you go and you pull it out at 25%. Well, you just got 10 basis points, 10%, or I should say 10%, not 10 basis points, in tax arbitrage there. So you save 35 cents up front to only pay 25 cents later. Good deal, right? Good deal. Now, if tax rates stay the same, this is where 401k can start to get a little bit more complicated, right? If they stay the same, you technically didn't save anything, right? You saved 35 basis points here, you paid 35 cents later. Your biggest benefit is the tax deferred growth inside of it, which is what we're going to cover in a second, but they stay the same. And then the other one to keep in mind is what if tax rates would go up, which I think is probably more realistic when you go back through that deficit conversation. So let's just use an example. You put a dollar away today, you say, let's just stick with that 35% tax bracket. You can plug in whatever bracket you're in here. Save 35 cents. But now when you go to pull it out, you got to pay 45 cents. Well, in that example, that did not help, right? That's where the Roth would make more sense. And wow, we don't think that could ever be the case, right? My tax brackets will come down in retirement. You can watch through our videos. You can Google search some other blog posts. If you are a good pre-tax saver, the thing that's going to trip you up the most is what we call RMDs, required minimum distributions. So even though you're thinking, well, I won't have that much earned income, right? Yeah, but you also probably have a certain lifestyle that you're accustomed to. So one, you're going to probably pull out that amount. But eventually when RMDs start, currently when we're recording this video, that is currently 75 years old. At 75, you're forced to pull out right around just a little bit shy of, of 4% and then I'll continue to go up. And I can show you plan after plan after plan where we work with high income households, breaking away pre-tax savings. And I show them if we don't take advantage of this beautiful window, which we, we really look towards Roth conversions, we might get actually a higher tax rate down the line. So that's something to keep in mind. But that is one of the more bad things about the 401k. And probably one of the reasons why you would question, is it worth it? So the liquidity and future tax rates are a big concern here when we come back to that. Now, this would be a lot easier. I wouldn't have as much gray hair as I do already starting to come in at my current age if we knew future tax rates. We don't. 
we don't even know what future tax rates will be next year, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now. And that's the most complicated part. So that is where it is difficult here. Um, we need to keep an eye on kind of how that could shift. But even there, we're still not going to know. So those are some bad sides to the 401k rebate. Let's hit the star of the show now and get into the overall benefits that we're seeing in terms of percentages. Okay. So for the actual research part of this, I used a fantastic post from Nick Majuli, who is part of the Rip Holtz gang over there. Love this group. Great research. Not only great research, but it's digestible. It's easy to understand. Uh, I feel like we're plugging in one of their posts on a weekly basis to our Wealth Heal Weekly. But Nick's post was from 2023. Still very relevant today. Again, recording this in 2024, which is important when you kind of click on numbers. Nick's goal was to compare the Roth 401k to the taxable account. And you're probably thinking, why the Roth? It was a smart comparison because he was trying to remove out the tax part of it, right? Because we don't know that answer. And for high income earners, I think that's really important. Again, for our group, most of our clients are 35, 37% tax bracket. So deferring today is still valuable. Now, could it come back later? And that tax rates are so higher than that? It certainly could, especially with those RMBs. That's one of our concerns there. But he brought it back to just more or less the benefits of deferring capital gains, right? That 1099 that you get out every year from your, your taxable account. I'm going to simplify it and I'm just going to give you the final answer from Nick's, but I, I wanted to add context to the Roth for the tax and what the reason why he did that. And at the end of it, he pretty much says the benefit of the tax deferred growth part of it turned out to be about 73 basis points. So basis points, just think 0.73%. So that's 73 basis points. So not quite 1%, just shy of 1% here at 73 basis points. Now, in Nick's research, that considered all things equal. So fees, all of that. And that's important because remember we just said, average 401k fees around 50 basis points. That could eat into that. Now, when the other part that's important here is what's the expense ratio on the 401k funds? What's the expense ratio on the taxable side? You would argue on the taxable side, you have the entire investment lineup out there. So you should be able to build a lower cost investment option. Now, if you already have a good low cost 401k, 403b lineup, probably a moot point. So Nick's main argument in a beautiful article, which we will list in the show notes, we'll have that down there for you so you can kind of see through everything. Non-liquid or the illiquidity that comes with a 401k plan worth the 73 basis points. And that's what it came down to. So, you know, when we come back to the main title of this post, is the 401k worth it? Notice so it's about worth 73 basis points, that tax deferred nature. Now, there's a lot of moving parts in there. I'd argue that the tax side is most important, but we don't know that answer. Only time will tell. And I think the biggest takeaway that you should, as a viewer of this video, is diversification. We kind of joke with our clients. If you could retire, and we only had three buckets. I love the bucket mentality. Pre-tax bucket, Roth bucket, taxable bucket. That's the trifecta right there. If you had equal amounts in all three, it'd be perfect. It doesn't work out that way because one, taxable account, you can actually put a lot more into. You're limited on what you can put into your 401k. The Roth, for the clients that we're aware, they're doing backdoor Roth, but regardless, whether you're doing a regular Roth or a backdoor Roth, you're still limited to that annual amount, you know, 2024 currently 7,000, but it goes back to having good tax diversification. So if I had to sum up everything today and I could give you the, the short clip of is it worth it, I do believe the 401k is still worth it. Even if you take out all the tax stuff, throw out the window, 73 basis points is still a good savings, right? You, you see how many different reports are out there on, well, if your financial advisor charges you 1% AUM, he wipes out all of your net worth someday. He's worse than coffee. So we know that 1% can have an effect. And again, nothing against AUM advice. Advisors because I would argue it, you know, there's a lot of value in that too. That's probably getting you more than one percent. So another topic, another day. Seventy three basis points. If you plug in all that, is a good number to keep in your back pocket. You're not going to be upset about that. But the liquidity is important. And your best way to overcome this would be for our clients to get high income households. We are very blessed in that capacity. This is why we like seeing K okay, maxed out back to a Roth IRA maxed out, maybe even sneaking in some HSA and starting to get money into that taxable account. It might not be a perfect amount every single month. It might come in from bonuses or whatever the example would be, starting to build that account up for better tax diversification. So I'm going to leave it at that. A great topic. I think one that kind of challenges the main answer out there. And actually, if you read through Nick's entire post, that's kind of why he wrote that as well. And I don't think there's a perfect answer to that 401k, 403b. I do like the tax side of it. But again, if you threw that out the window, I still like even the cost savings in there, but to each their own. And everyone's situation is going to be different, right? Some people will need liquidity more than others. And that's very important here. The Roth part of it is very important. So 
do your research, understand your financial plan, talk to your financial advisor about these things, right? What if I keep putting everything in pretext? What do my RMDs look like? What if I do need money randomly? What are my options here? Understand all those moving parts. So as always, thanks for hanging out with me for the last 15 minutes or so. If you enjoyed this one, let us know. Give us a thumbs up. Drop us some comments and questions. That's where we continue to build our content from. Also in the show notes below, there'll be a, a link there that you can even go to our Google form if you want to keep a question more private and just send it over to us directly. Uh, but again, thanks for hanging out with me for the last 15 minutes. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe yet. But most importantly, catch you on the next video.